welcome everyone to both and Immaterial Mediators with Julian Swartz. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. I'm Mathilde walker Bio. I'm a white woman with short brown hair. Behind me, there is a detail of a colorful work on paper by Cello, a work from the museum's collection, currently on view. I'm creator of programming at the American Folk Art Museum, and I'm joining you today from Queens, New York. I want to acknowledge that our museum stands upon Lenape Hawking, the unceded traditional homeland of the Lenape Delaware peoples. We honor Lenape people past, present, and future, and are committed to centering indigenous perspectives in exhibitions and programs at the museum. As many of you know, a FAM is dedicated to uplifting the work of self-taught and folk artists across time and place. Next slide, please. And we're thrilled to celebrate the artists of our collection with our current exhibition, Material Witness, Folk and Self-Taught Artists, now on view at Tulicon Square until October 29th, along with a concurrent exhibition, What That Quilt Knows About Me. Material Witness, which explores how artists learn with and through material engagement, is the first in a series of thematic shows generously supported by a grant from the Henry Luce Foundation. This series of exhibitions invites us to admire the museum's rich and diverse collection up close. I'm very pleased to be joined today by the creator of this exhibition series, Brooke Wyatt. Hi, Brooke. Um, as AFAM's Luce assistant curator, she is responsible for researching and showcasing the museum's collection while presenting an expensive history of American art. So Brooke and I have imagined a series of online programs that can accompany her curatorial endeavors in the museum's gallery. It's a series of investigations into the collection, which expands on Brooke's interpretation of the objects and fosters new scholarship. We've titled this series both and in reference to artist and writer, Lorraine O'Grady, who's using the concept of both end uh, to think in a non-hierarchical and an inclusive way. This concept um, serves as a methodological device to think beyond the untrained skill craft art, amateur fine art divides that have historically marginalized the fields of folk and self-taught art. So our intention here with this series is to engage critically with the history and the specificity of EFAM's collection, uncovering uh, any identity-based tropes and formation that may have circumscribed the reading of objects and of their makers. And we're really excited uh, to present the second installment of this series today with Julian Swartz, an educator and a sculptor who I greatly admire. So hi, Julian, we're really, really happy to have you here. So thank you for joining us. Um, so Julian Swartz creates immersive installations combining intangible elements like sound, light, hair, and magnetism. And we're going to learn more about this today. And she combines this, um, these elements with a variety of materials like ceramics or glass to build multi-sensory experiences. So with Julian, we will be encouraged to look at the ways artists transform everyday materials into objects of intimacy and use what's at end to record and channel unseen forces and energies. Just a quick note on sequencing. So Brooke will begin with a few words on the exhibition Material Witness, followed by Julian who will present her practice and discuss it with Brooke in relation to works by Judith Scott, Emery Blackdon, and Melvin Edward Nelson now on view in the exhibition uh, Material Witness. And there will be time for questions at the end of the conversation. So we invite you to share questions for our speakers throughout the talk using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. I'll be using the chat room to share more details about the program. I will also include a PDF of the PowerPoint presentation so you can consult it independently. And if you need any additional information, please drop me a line in the, in the chat. 
And before I turn it over to Brooke and Julian, please know that closed captioning in English is available today by clicking on the CC button at the bottom of your screen. And today's program includes live interpretation in American Sign Language. This program is being recorded and will be made available online in the coming weeks. We are grateful for opportunities like this program to connect online, which will not be possible without you. So thank you for being here. I hope you will consider supporting our programs through a donation to the museum following this conversation. Your support has great impact and makes a difference in our ability to champion the work of folk and self-taught artists. So thank you. And now I'll hand it over to Brooke and Julian. Please welcome them both. Thank you, Mathilde, and thank you everyone who's who's here with us today um, and making this this event possible. Um, I I want to check about the alt text that we have entered for the images that are in each of our slides, um, just to let everyone know that that information is embedded in in the PDF of our of our PowerPoints that I think Mathilde will share very soon. Um, so let's go ahead to the next slide, please. Um, I'm, ex I'm really excited about today because the exhibition um, Material Witness, Folk and Self-Taught Artists at Work has four sections. And today we're focusing on the section that probably uh, inspired my idea for the show as a whole the most, which is a section called In the Spirit. And it, it, it informed the original title I had for this exhibition, which was Material Mediators, because I am fascinated by the ways that artists and makers and humans in general use use raw materials and use objects as ways to, to channel, to find access, to commune with or connect with themselves, one another, and perhaps spiritual, uh, metaphysical, natural, otherworldly realms as well. So that's our focus today is the way that materials can mediate between perhaps the, the, the plane of, of existence that is measurable and that we, you know, can be described with, with language um, and, and other, uh, other aspects to our existence and experience. Um, and here we're looking at a, an installation view of one of the walls in the in the spirit section and seeing examples of artists using materials like earth, uh, minerals for pigment, um, materials gathered from their immediate environment uh, and turned into art materials, and also valuable materials like silver that when shaped into different forms, not only take on value because of the value of their innate materials, but then also the forms. And I'm talking about a group of silver milagros that are installed in the plexiglass case that is in the center of the wall in the image we're looking at. Um, once these pieces of silver are carved into shapes like an airplane or a car, they then are representing a voyage, for example, or a trip, and they become sort of like prayer charms or uh, talismans holding like hope and belief in the hopes that the trip will be safe. So that, that potential of materials to um, maybe hold and embody our, our beliefs um, maybe to channel healing or protection, um, to enable communion with the divine or and the, the, the natural or supernatural world. Um, 
was really a is really the focus of, of in the spirit. And um, if we go to the next slide, please, we'll see another installation view of the exhibition. And um, this is still the in the spirit section where the walls of the exhibition are painted a light blue. I forgot to mention that myself, I am a white woman with brown hair, wearing glasses and a light blue cardigan. Um, so, dear mediators, Go to the next slide, please, which is um, a detailed photo of, of a work by Emery Blagden that is in the In the Spirit section and that we are going to talk about work by this artist um, much more in depth coming up soon. So I just wanted to um, end here with, for, for my overview of, of material witness, um, thinking about how materials can be harnessed by artists to, to enable that, that communion, that communication um, with different worlds and how um, this often, materials are not always what, again, the things that can be described with language or the things that can be perceived. Um, it might be, material of light, the material of sound, um, materials including faith or memory. Um, so so with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Julianne. Hi, everybody. Um, if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, Actually, I'll, I'll start by introducing myself. Uh, my name is Julianne, and I am a, um, a white woman in my 50s, and um, I'm wearing a green jacket and a white pin with black lettering that says, Imagine Peace. And um, this is a Yoko Ono work that I'm wearing on my um on my uh, jacket and I was asked to look through the um, artists in this exhibition and find uh, correlations with my own work and I actually found very strong correlations with these three artists um, Judith Scott, Emery Blagden and Melvin Edward Nelson. So I'll start with Judith Scott and um, I'll describe what we're seeing on the screen before I talk about the work. On the left, we have a sculpture with an oval dome shape that's on a um, flat white surface. And the sculpture appears to be wrapped in many layers of different colors of string and yarn. And on the right, there is a black and white photograph by Leon Borenstein, which shows the artist Judith Scott embracing one of her sculptural works. And Judith Scott is a white woman with Down syndrome. And in this picture, her hair is in a bun and she's wearing a shirt with a floral pattern and um, plain colored pants. And the ideas I pulled out from Judith Scott's work that I, relate closely to is um, intimacy with material, touch as ritual and care, and emanation from inside. So I feel like these objects are embodied and they're embodied through this repetitive labor of winding and wrapping fibers over various materials. Uh, I think of this continual layering to build the form and mass as a, it, it mimics organic processes of building life, like um, tree rings or coral formation or cell reproduction. And 
I see this um, repetition of touch in the sculptures. You can you can just imagine that process of Scott, you know, touching and winding and wrapping and holding, you know, over and over again to build this mass. Um, next slide, please. On the left, um, we have uh, a sculpture by Judith Scott that's made primarily of cream colored yarn that has been wrapped and knotted around an armature of some kind that's not visible, but it gives the object a shape, um, kind of like a, um, like a horn sticking up shape. Uh, the object is 28 inches high, 12 inches wide and 18 inches deep. And then on the right, there's two installation views of this object. Um, these forms, I find them very anthropomorphized, but not human. They, they don't feel to me like human bodies or animal bodies or alien bodies, but they feel alive in their, in their own right. Um, there's always this, in these objects, this mysterious unrevealed center and, uh, what's in there is such a mystery it's barely visible or not visible at all but so active and i see the um there's kind of a porosity the objects are solid but not solid uh and i feel i think that maybe there's like space between the layers that gives these objects that sense of uh porosity um, next slide, please. I love this sculpture um, because what's inside is somewhat revealed. You know, that that tubing. Um, what we're looking at is a sculpture that is 28 inches in height, 15 inches wide, and 27 inches deep. And it's clear plastic tubing and black circular pieces of plastic and many objects inside um, wrapped and wrapped um, knotted yarns of many colors that hold it together like a bundle. Um, so I can see some of these materials in here and I recognize them. They're ubiquitous, um, but they're also infused with such power um, through this repeated touch. Um, I feel the artist's intimacy with these objects when I see them um, through that wrapping and winding process. And so then I feel intimate with the objects. Um, the care, I can uh, see the care that the artists put into, into the winding wrapping process and so that's what i'm responding to with my own care of these objects and i have a sense that for scott touch and tactile feedback is really important in this work um, i don't know how much i wonder how much of this process is through um, tactile feedback like how much information about the building is she getting through touch um, and how much is through uh, vision. And I just, uh, it seems like a very, very active conversation back and forth with the materials. Um, next slide, please. So this is uh, my work and I'll describe the images that you're seeing. Um, uh, there's four vessels on the screen that are made from uh, translucent white glass and unglazed porcelain. And the, the objects are sitting on a wooden surface. And the objects in the picture are approximately two feet by three feet by maybe 10 inches. They are bulbous shapes with several holes of different sizes and some parts of the objects are folded, wrinkled, and collapsed. 
So the project here is called Sign Body and uh, the year is 217 to 219. And uh, this work is also really based on tactile feedback. Um, actually, tactile feedback, sonic feedback. Um, so I chose these materials, the glass and the porcelain, for their sonic qualities, how they hold and amplify sound, and also because they have both hard and soft states. So I used uh, the fired ceramic objects in the vitrified state to impress the molten glass when it was in its soft state, and then vice versa, uh, the hardened glass objects to impress the wet clay. So that back and forth process um, records the pressure of the two materials in the finished vessels. So each one of these is an instrument that plays its own sound. And I use a feedback process to um, locate and amplify and filter the sound from, from these vessels. So I draw out a tone, it's either one or two tones depending on the number of holes in the vessel. And I draw out tones that resonate optimally in each vessel. And so I could make an analogy of when you pick up a seashell and you hear a tone in it. If I, um, if, if you amplified that, it would sound kind of like a drone tone. And so um, every vessel has a particular set of resonant frequencies that are a result of that form's size, shape, and number of holes. So I don't add any sounds. These objects just make their own sounds and I find them and draw them out. Uh, next slide, please. So this image shows me activating some of the objects to make sound. And I do this by inserting a small microphone into one of the holes in the object to pick up the sound of the air in the vessel. And then I um, filter out feedback. Um, and when I find a resonant tone, it rings out uh, in that shape naturally amplified by the shape and the material of the vessel. And then once I find the tone, I can adjust it somewhat, uh, kind of play it, modulate it by closing off the holes. So there's a lot of um, tactile interaction with that object. It's an intimate process with that object. And there is a lot of physical feedback. I can feel the resonant tone vibrating the material. Um, and I can feel when I find that resonant tone, it produces air out of the holes of the object. So it's like the whole object kind of comes together and starts to vibrate and ring. The tones that are produced are very powerful and can be actually felt viscerally, like uh, they vibrate material. So you can feel them, um, I, I feel them predominantly in my chest. It depends on the frequencies, but um, you can really feel them in your body if you're in the room with them. So um, I'll play this next video, which shows me playing the vessels with a microphone and you can hear some of the sounds drawn from them. If we could play that video, please.
So if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, this next slide shows the objects playing their own tones in an installation setting. So sometimes I play them in a performance setting where I activate them live. And sometimes I just let them play their tones together in um, a random sequence of you know, harmony, dissonance. Sometimes they layer and make very dense, um, complicated uh, dissonances and harmonies. And um, they also sometimes make beat frequencies, which are um, like percussive, uh, percussive frequencies from the layering of tones. So we could um, play this video, please. Thank you, Julianne. It's mesmerizing to get to experience, um, you know, maybe looking, listening, or even feeling the vibrations that are, for me, coming through my headphones. And when I don't have the headphones plugged in, if I'm just touching my computer and the sound is coming through the speakers the computer itself is is vibrating which is not always something we can experience in virtual programs and getting to hear your um hear you talking about your work at the same time is is a, really a resonant and and layered experience thank you so much We're looking at um, an image of Julianne's work, um, Sign Body, on, on the left, and, and the work by Judith Scott with the plastic tubing bundled inside of different colors of yarn on the right. And um, there are so many, for me, really exciting paths we could follow to explore some of the material um, connections between your work and and Scott's work um so we'll just we'll, we'll we'll talk about a few today but I think that the one of my favorite things about this series of both and programs is that we are trying to make space to listen for the the questions that objects and artists in AFAM's collection are asking or that they pose to us as viewers, um, as curators, and as, as humans. So the idea that 
that you've talked about of tactile feedback that's important in your own making process and that you're sensing in Scott's process as well um, made me think about how a relationship between materials, ways of working, like a working process and the, the maker um, all involved together and um, how I was thinking about when from, from seeing documentation, photographs and videos of Judith Scott working in her studio space, she, she was often engaged with the materials at, at pretty close range. So she's seated at a table and then she's doing the process of wrapping, bundling, knotting the fibers in gathering these objects together in the space that she can access at the city at this table, often turning the objects around as she works and thinking about this process and how it's it, it brings it brings you know certain certain qualities and and your your suggestion that maybe it was the tactile feedback that really informed the form or really shaped the the shape and gave and maybe gave shape to this uh, relationship or this interaction between Scott and the object that it was in that space of of making and I kind of contrasted the idea of of Scott working so closely it's a very different approach than say having a, a blueprint in advance of what form you're going to make um, or it's different from working, um, you know, maybe adding some components to a sculpture as a work in progress and then stepping back and take, taking in the overall shape and then maybe going and adjusting. Um, and perhaps it's a it's a process guided guided more by touch or just as much by touch and or uh, as as by other other sensory feedbacks. and um, So, so in in sign body, the in your work, the the idea that of forms being shaped through both the material qualities that the material brings, the innate qualities, and then also the process. I loved when you talked about the the, the hard and soft states. So it reminds us to think about that there's a flux, that there's a there's a transformation happening, and a shape, a state shifting process um so i don't know if i've <laughs> if i've touched on anything that you want to comment further on um i'll just pause for a moment but i have i have a couple more thoughts along these lines <laughs> well i think um something about the hard and soft um is that it's a it's a record of of an impression so it's a record of of something pressing in um and then you know with scott's work i feel you know these are scott's materials are um in a way they're not they're not they're solid but they're they're not um forms they're you know strings they're fibers but they become solid through um like a nodding um, tangling kind of process. So I, I feel like both of these processes are almost like stress processes, uh, mm -hmm. processes of um, and it, like finding form through through uh, these, you know, kind of intense physical processes. Can we, um, maybe you could talk about that. I'm getting the impression thinking about the the glass and the porcelain um, going from soft to hard states and that there's a time factor. There's some time pressure there. Um, so 
and if if that if that transition between states in a way if you're allowing that to, to create the forms as they are you know the degree to which the materials themselves and then their transition through these different states at different temperatures um kind of generate the forms as they are with those impressions and then the, the impressions are from ways that you are are handling the materials while they're going through the transformations of the states right yeah, yeah. so the forms um um through that 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 transformation process that, and that's why they're not regular forms or regular i should say not regular shapes so they're holding and they're embodying this documentation of the of the of their transformation process that happened in, in collaboration with with you yes and uh the transformation process meaning the like pressure of the other materials and also the time because it yeah, especially the glass changes you know just moment to moment another connection um that we can pursue between between sign body and and scott's work um could be the idea of of what's inside and what's maybe hidden or unknown um and the outer sort of an outer uh boundary or edge and in sign body i keep thinking about how the porcelain part of the the forms is opaque so we can't see what's inside whereas then you have the translucent glass some of it's very clear some of it seems a little more cloudy but um it's still possible to see what's what's inside was there what was your thinking around that that the contrast between the opacity and the translucent translucency of these particular materials well, what is inside the porcelain uh, necessarily in order to get the sound is a speaker. So uh, there's there's small speakers in there and that's how I'm reading the air mass inside. And I didn't necessarily want to see that, but I did really want to see the emptiness that what's coming out of them, you know, what's coming out of them is very full, very um present that sound is very embodied um and full and but i wanted to see the emptiness you know the physical emptiness again thank you so much for 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 joining us because it's it's incredible to get to kind of like dig deeper through the through all the layers of your of your process with you and um you know i know part of our conversation around Scott's work in particular has been about this, this desire or sometimes an expectation that we reveal what's inside or that we try to, that we, that we, we, we try to know. I, I think that um, some, or at least one of Judith Scott's sculptures has been x-rayed, for example. And one of the questions that I felt asked by by the work by Scott that's in Material Witness, and one of the questions that really fueled um, our thinking, Matilda and and mine, in developing the Both And series was um, to push back against this urge or this desire to always reveal what's inside, um, and to start to question if certain knowledge, certain awareness, certain experiences are not maybe meant to be shared or are not knowable by all people. And um, something about, about experiencing this work today, both your, both your work in dialogue with Scott's work, and then all of us here together in this Zoom forum, um, it's, it's also reminding me that there are a lot of other ways of of experiencing and interacting with each other and with materials and with our senses maybe then than the the ones we rely on so often in art history or 
in a in a museum setting where we want to have language to talk about something we want to have an you know an image to reproduce to uh, map it out and sometimes we even want to know what's inside and um here we're we're getting a chance to experience a lot of other other kind of dimensions Should we, uh, on that note, should we continue to? Yeah, let's go on to um, Emory Blagden. Great, next slide, please. Thank you. Thank you, Brooke. Um, so I had not been familiar with Emory Blagden's work. And then when I started to research it, I was really shocked at how many correlations there are with my own and um, how interested how interesting his process is to me. Um, here we see a picture of Emery Blagden um, in a, I don't know what the date of this picture is, um, but it's, M it's Blagden in his uh, installation, which he called the healing machine. And he is a, in this picture, he's a white man with a long gray beard. He's wearing an orange baseball cap and a green shirt with the sleeves rolled up. And he's surrounded by multiple hanging sculptures and a lot of sparkle and reflected light. Um, and um, the ideas I wanna draw out for this artist are unseen forces and invisible materials, conduits and conductors, and belief and functionality. Next slide, please. So um, what you're seeing now are, um, you're seeing um, sculptures made from repeating shapes of metal cut into squares. Um, looks like some kind of, um, Many, many materials, hanging, cardboard, um, a doorway looking into a, a wooden space, um, many, many hanging metallic objects. So it's a detail of this project of Blagden's that he worked on for 30 years, um, which was a wooden shed filled with about 400 handmade objects made with wire, foil, glass, TV parts, radio parts, car parts, many other materials. Um, and Blagden called the installation the healing machine and believed it to have measurable healing effect on bodies, his own body and other bodies. With this work, Blagden called on alternative forces to heal after experiencing the failure of traditional medical modalities because he suffered the losses of both his parents and, uh, and I think also several siblings to cancer. And I also, I, I think that Blagden was also trying to heal himself with this machine. Um, next slide, please. So in this slide and the next slide, I'm showing lots of close details that I um, took as screenshots from a video. So you can see um, up close some of the materials in this work. Um, on the left, you see a close up view of a component of the healing machine where copper, there's lots of wire coils of copper wi wire uh, wound around linear pieces of um, silver gauge. Uh, heavier gauge wire and um, other metal parts. And on the right, it's a close up view, another close up view where wooden popsicle sticks are stacked and bundled together with wire and masking tape. And there's something there that looks like a rock, or I, I think it might be a magnet. Um, next slide. More um, close-up views of Blagden's work. Um, more, uh, let's see, on the left is um, metal 
cut into like metal foil cut into shapes with wire around it lots of wire coils around wood coils around coils um, on the right there's a, a large wire coil over a piece of metal and then some small glass jars with what looks like sand inside of them so when i'm looking at this work i recognize elements that could make electricity and that is not something that is something that blagden did talk about in relation to this work but it's never something that i've seen documented that it was actively making electricity so i have a lot of questions um, about you know does it work how does it work what does working mean in relation to this um, installation um, healing what what kind of healing are we talking about was there some electricity being transmitted that was you know a, a healing that that could be felt um you know what is the energy that was being transmitted here um blagden would speak you know when in in accounts i've read he would speak about electromagnetism and electricity as primary components but i just wonder you know what where is that line between belief and functionality um next slide please so i just uh, put these slides in of um, two processes, uh, a magnetic coil and a voltaic stack, which um, could very well have been happening in that work, even though I haven't seen um, research talking about it. What you're looking at on the left is a magnet with two um, wire, two, two colors of wire, wrapped around the magnet in different parts. And then those two um, pieces of wire attached to a light bulb and the light bulb gets electricity from that interaction of the magnet and the wire coil. And then on the right, the voltaic stack, you're seeing pennies, but this could be any kind of metal stacked together with um, acid in between. So it could be like cloth with um, vinegar or, um, any kind of acidic um, material there, salt. Um, and then that can also power, that can make electricity, like a small amount of electricity. Um, next slide, please. So here's more details of Blagden's work, um, where you can see like some of these processes could be happening I don't know, it could be happening. I asked Brooke if research had explored the electrical functionality of this project, but she was not aware that there had been that research done. But through this work, I see magnets and, well, I don't, I don't know if they're magnets. I see a lot of metal stacks and a lot of coils. So I wonder how much of this was consciously assembled by Blagden, you know, as electrical conduits. And I wonder if, you know, he researched it or intuited it, was it channeled, did it work? All, all of these, you know, really interesting questions to me. Uh, next slide, please. More components of Blagden's healing machine uh, made from wire, paper, um, tinfoil, and other objects. Um, next slide, please. So this is um, one of my works. I, I use electricity and magnetism frequently in my own work. Um, it's an invisible, but also very discernible material. And the product of the uh, electricity and magnetism is vibration, which can be sometimes heard and, and also seen. 
Uh, the, in this image, this image, uh, you're looking at a piece called Bone Score Paper Zero. And the image shows a very large piece of handmade translucent paper hanging at an angle from a five foot long oval, uh, a steel, uh, steel wire oval. And then the image on the right shows the same piece, but in movement, blurred in movement. So this work uses wire coils like what I showed you previously and magnets to transmit sound and kinetic energy through material. In this work, the electric impulse of recorded sounds can be heard and seen as vibration through this wire and paper. So if you look at the material list on the left, it says stainless steel wire, magnet wire, magnet, abaca paper, amplifier, audio player, wood, sounds of breathing, of a whispered conversation, a timpani drum, rustling paper, a child's laugh, a storm, thunder. So in this work, I always list the score of sounds as part of the materials of the work. And the sounds are chosen for their references, but also for the vibration they produce in the work. Um, let's go to the next slide, please. This is another work that uses um, vibration, but it's not vibration. It uses a sound vibration, but it's not a sound that you can hear. You only see it as um, vibration in the wires. So this image shows a, an ir irregular, long, thin vessel woven from very thin rust-colored wire. The dimensions are 50 by five by seven inches. There's a small ball sewn in the middle of the form. And on the right side of the frame, there's a detailed image that shows a close-up of the wire. So this vessel is woven from copper wire and includes several active coils that receive electricity from a sound player. So there's sound being played through these wires and the ball in the center is a magnet that turns the sound into vibration. The vessel tremors intermittently with that vibration, but since there is no surface material for the sound to vibrate, there is no orality, nothing to hear. You can't hear the sound, you just see the vibration of it in the wires. Um, and then next slide, please. I'll show video documentation of both of these works. And the first one, you won't hear anything. And the second one, you will hear um, the sound kind of um, as, um, as reflected off of the paper. Could play that, please. So the um, the vessel is trembling intermittently. The, um, the rustling of the paper, and also the sounds on the surface of the paper.
Next slide, please. I'll join you again, Julianne. Thank you for for sharing these these videos and taking us on to this through this this journey through Blagden's healing machine and asking many many questions about um, functionality and that I think connect with ideas of of meaning and how we make meaning of um, out of our daily lives, the world around us, um, ritual experiences or actions that we take. Um, for the first time, I'm thinking about all the repetition of coiling and and folding and stacking that went into the production of Blackton's work here, you know, some 400 or more of these objects that were compiled together and that have now been mostly separated in into different museum collections. Um, and so certainly a question comes up about, you know, where we, I guess, are appreciating and interacting with these objects um in ways that 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 may be pretty different from how Blagden did maybe maybe different in some ways maybe related in other ways um but definitely questions um that you know I don't I don't have definitive answers to but that I want to think about um around you know what it means to to, I guess, appreciate this work aesthetically for the, um, the subtle movement. You know, when you walk past the Blagden's work, we have a component from the Healing Machine, one component installed in Material Witness, and it's casting these shadows on the wall. When you walk past it, the air that, that your body moves, you know, causes the sculpture to, to turn and twist. And then the shadows on the wall also turn and move. And, um, and the question, the, the questions about functionality that you're bringing up, I think relate to some big questions around the field of self-taught art that are, that are very important and that are ethical questions um, around artists intentions and what we can know and what we maybe we can't know because of the histories of the way these works were made uh and the way that they entered into the the awareness of the, the art world and the art market and and so on so um anecdotal reports from people who who were inside the healing machine say that you know hair in certain in certain locations inside the shed you know your hair would stand on end people talked about being able to feel um uh, a tingling sensation like an electrical current was you know like they were becoming part they were also channeling on what was in there and and the the network of wires that was connected to um the electrical circuits to the it was plugged in so to speak um and there were also strings of christmas tree lights and things like that in, involved and this question of functionality again it's kind of making making me rethink and ponder some high some possible hierarchies that um that have been, you know, I've learned and I and I reproduce or, or rely on, and that maybe I want to start questioning around, um, you know, aesthetic functionality or mechanical or electrical functionality, and um, because it's it's becoming more and more urgent to me to think about um, the value of what might be intangible, what might be invisible, what might be immeasurable um and at the same time to hold a to hold kind of a 
a respect and to not be dismissive of Blackden's work and Blackden's project as being um, an amateur, um, not functional sort of um, But there was so much work that went into this that, um, and, and again, not all measurable. It seems like there was a great deal of belief and, and also actual labor um, and a lot of physical time that he spent with these materials in this space. And uh, yeah, so all of these in, in a way that, you know, the distinction that it's not a, a way of thinking that's not often, that I haven't often heard, um, applied or considered to work by self-taught artists is, is, is the way that conceptual art is talked about in terms of experiments or measurements, um, documenting or enacting different processes, art as a, as a venue for asking questions or a venue for experimentation again, whereas, I think Blagden's practice is is in, in many ways both very conceptual, or we could use the language that that, that can can be used to to talk about and think about conceptual art to describe it. We can we can talk about it using a lot of different languages, and perhaps you know we could even experience it. We could even feel it if we were able to to be in the space. Yeah, what 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 counts as as functionality, you know? Well, I would say in this case, what counts is um, healing, because yeah. that was the intention. So he was he was talking about electrical impulses and electromagnetism in relation to healing. So that's the part um, that is, you know, most interesting to me. Yes, does it function electrically, but also um, how does that electrical impulse uh, relate to healing? And you know, what 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 were people feeling in those accounts of you know, their hair standing up and stuff like that? I know some family members did were invited, but never chose to never go inside. It wasn't it wasn't an experience they wanted to have. But um, sounds like we're one 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 thing we're getting at is that you, if you take the any kind of measurable um, electromagnetic fields or currents that um, are activated in Blagden's work, and then you add the you know maybe measurable to some degree, but the sort of the power of healing or a belief or a, a seeking of that, of access to that. Um, you know, perhaps it's the combination of these and other and other factors that ultimately is 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 how it functions. Right? That there's some kind of, you know, you can't just discount the role of of belief or that that pursuit of healing. Well, in, in any healing, I think you can't discount the role of belief in any kind of medicine at all. I mean, that's that's my my belief, actually. Well, I, we, time has, has really escaped us. We have another artist whose work we wanted to explore. Um, but I but I know we are running running short on time. Um, let's see, why don't we go to the next slide, please? And, um, maybe we can consider Melvin Edwards Nelson uh, along the, the themes that you outlined, Julianne, and, and look at your work that you've paired with, with Nelson, and then we can, we can open up for a discussion. Um, yes, this is, um, we're looking at a watercolor by Melvin Edward Nelson, and it's 11 inches by 17 inches. It's an orb with blue and purple wavy stripes floating in the background above layers of paint. Um, 
that traverse the paper diagonally. So Melvin um, Edward Nelson um, was fascinated with the universe, planets, and atoms. I read that he built a planetron, which was a device that allowed him to track UFOs, but I wasn't able to find any pictures of that. The ideas I wanted to bring out with Nelson was um, resource loop, transmutation of material and traces of process, scale shift micro to macro. And next slide, please. Um, another uh, painting by Melvin Edward Nelson, and this is um, 17 and 78 inches high and 24 inches wide, made with graphite ink and mineral pigments on paper, mounted on canvas. In the painting, curved black lines surround a circle where colorful dots and black shapes resembling spermatozoa repeat. In addition to using watercolors, Edward Nelson painted with handmade pigments from materials in his environment. So crushed soil and rock samples dug up on his property mixed with water. I read an account um, that a UFO landed in a clearing near his home. And when it left, he was able to gather the dust from the landing site and began to use it in his paintings. And I wondered if this was the beginning of his use of earth and rock dust as pigment. Next slide, please. Um, here you can see this painting um, is all pigment. Um, and it's a, it's a uh, 13 by 20 inch drawing and the lines are kind of blurry and there it's mostly brown color on the outside and then there's a circular um, concentric form in the middle that's reddish bluish and greenish um, next slide please um, you can go back to the slide before yeah these are this is a work in progress so I'm showing something that isn't finished, but it's in my studio right now. But it was the closest thing to um, Nelson's, Edward Nelson's work. And this is a project called Prayers and Incantations. And these are uh, ceramic speakers that I'm making. What you're looking at on the um, image is four cone-like, actually five cone-like ceramic forms cracked and burnt, and the size of them varies. Um, they're about 12 by six inches, uh, roughly. And these are handmade speakers made from steel and ceramic. And they're fired first in a kiln, and the high level of heat from the kiln magnetizes the steel so that they function as speakers. And then I put them through a second fire in an outdoor pit and wrap them in organic materials, my own kitchen scraps that I save. And the stress of the process is recorded in the objects as marks and cracks on the surfaces and also becomes a physical filter as sound distorts through these irregular and fragile surfaces. Um, I started making these knowing that I intended to play a specific kind of sound through them. Um, uh, invocations of a sort. And after I made several, I found out about ancient Aramaic incantation bowls that have some, some things in common with these that were used as protection amulets. Um, so I'm going to show a very uh, amateur uh, video from my studio here. And the sounds playing through these are both human and non-human sounds, as well as water and fire sounds. I'm not gonna say too much about the recordings because the work is still in progress, but in this video, you can see a little bit of um, here, how the uh, sound is distorted through the surfaces and hear them functioning as speakers. 
So we'll just play maybe uh, 30 seconds of this video, please. Thank you. Next slide, please. Thank you, Julian. Was that the world premiere of, <laughs> of yes. a video yeah. of this work? <laughs> the world premiere, yeah. Really well, exciting. it's not done, but um, but it you know it was the closest. It made sense with um, Edward Nelson. And you even used the word that. Uh, you used the word record recorded that that there were recordings in the in the bodies of these forms from the I think it was the the, the process in the kiln or and I thought about how Nelson also talked about uh, his works as recordings rather than paintings and I think that I wonder if what we're seeing in some of the uh, the ways that the, the, the pigment appears um, almost patterned or variegated, uh, sort of like you're looking through a microscope at a cell or something inside of a petri dish or something. If it if it was that he he was engaging in some kind of process of making an impression, almost like a print or a mono print, maybe he had the he crushed up the the minerals. That he was drawing from the land and then um, suspended those in some kind of liquid and then it made an impression with the paper. I, I wondered if that was if that was part of his process and how we were getting these kind of modeled surfaces. But in any event, there's a there's a recording that's happening. And then he also often dated and uh, labeled the, the recording based on the forces that he believed he was documenting which I think often in, in, involved UFO landings. I think for Nelson, this was a perhaps a regular occurrence. Um, will we open up our, our conversation? Yes, hi, thank you so much, both of you for this conversation and for Julian for sharing your knowledge. I think it was really fantastic to, to look at the collection with um, the question of energy, and forces in mind, um, fascinating approach um, that also I feel like continues this conversation we have um, in the, um, you know, as part of the service both end last time we had Jessica Cooley, an art historian and a creator who, uh, with whom we explored um, methodological approaches to thinking about disability and um, self-taught art and with you Julian and Brooke also today it was more like approaches to to thinking about um, about knowledge production and self-taught art and I thought that was and also science you know the limits between science and art and that was really fascinating and so I think um I think you, Julian, really think about like materiality not only as a result of creative labor, but also as a carrier of unseen energies and thinking about the way the sculptures of Judith Scott, but also every Black Dunn and, uh, and Melvin Nelson challenge our system, um, our belief system and our truth making system. So. So that was really an interesting approach. So thank you, Julian, for, for sharing your knowledge about magnetism. I think I learned a lot today. <laughs> and, um, and also just uh, learning a lot about looking at this object in different ways. And I, that's something maybe I'll start. I know that um, 
um, we we have a few questions from our audience, but maybe to start this, and, and we know, I know we're running late, so thank you everyone for staying with us for a few more minutes. But um, but I think I was interested in thinking uh, along um, uh, with uh, Jessica Cooley's uh, thinking about disability and the fact that some of us uh, cultures, uh, Judith Scott, because we talked about Judith Scott last time, and how the earth culture sometimes starts to unravel and what does that mean in terms of museum standard and i think in in the case of Mel, Melville nelson and also every black done the works also don't um or like uh, you know challenge museum um set museum standards and 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 the reason for that is that because they were not made to be shown in museums and i was i would like to to talk to you julian and 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 brooke about this duality in the work um and i think that's something also that is so present in your work julian um and uh does how does that contribute to making this object this and 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 the and the practice of this artist um powerful and also um attractive to us today Well, when you're talking um, about, um, I guess essentially you're talking about conservation and and you know having something be conservable, and it made me think about what what is prioritized, and so what is prioritized, um, I think in, um, I mean, I know that sometimes in my own work, I will prioritize the immediate experience, like the experience of um, being with the work over the experience of being able to document the work. Um, mm. and that, that's just a choice that I make um, personally sometimes. Um, and it can be problematic, but, um, and I, I think that with uh, Scott, I mean, I don't want to assume what her prioritization was, but I also feel like her, I'm going to, I, if I if I was going to make a guess at what her prioritization was, it would be the making, like that feedback that she's having in that moment with that material is her prioritization and not the product, but the, but the, you know. Performance also. Correct. Mm -hmm. interaction yes the the interaction of making mm -hmm. and then with Blagden you know again not to assume but if I'm going to apply um a theory on what his um uh, his prioritization was it was you know in the moment uh, you know to give himself or people who entered the machine a moment of experience, a very particular kind of experience. So, you know, it, it and then uh, for, for Nelson, it was a recording. It was a process of recording something. So none of these artists, you know, were, were in a way making something to be retained. As you said, their, their intention wasn't to be retained in a museum. So it's, it's a choice, you know, in the making. Thing. But also it speaks to our history of contemporary sculptures, which, you know, if you go back to this idea of Michael Fried against object two, you know, are the, you know, that's also it's kind of also it's kind of could be a definition of of modern sculptures or contemporary sculptures. I mean, I, I would be curious to hear your thinking also here, Julian, because you also prioritize experience over objecthood. He, and um, in some ways, it also can hurt the experience. Or like, I, I was wondering, but if you could talk about also how the work is understood and perceived in the art world through that prioritization of of the experience over the materiality or like preservation. Well, it just reinforces. Um, a, you know, it's it's such a different, it's always a different experience with every work to, um, you know, to see it in person versus to have documentation of it with every work. But some works are more, um, you know, that distance is wider. 
and you know it i think that it it can um reduce the audience if if a work can only if a work is much more um, active in person than in documentation, it means that someone has to be with it to experience it. And that does reduce the audience, but um, I don't know, that's just, you know, that that's where I've been able, that's, mm -hmm. that's where I want to be with my work. I mean, I, I think that it has to do also with, um, establishing a relationship with the viewer that is very um, intimate. And so that isn't always, I don't know. And it, it's also relying on um, things that are not always visible. So. But yeah, but I feel like it's really part of what we call contemporary art, you know, this idea of like crossing boundaries. And that's why also probably um Black Dawn and Judith Scott and, and the work of um Nelson resonate so much with us or with um contemporary practice like yours. Yes, that is why. Because of the ephemeral, you know, because of the ephemeral qualities and like these other these other concerns that aren't necessarily aesthetic. Mm -hmm. So I would say other intentions so that, you know, it is all of those practices are uh, conceptual practices because of the other intentions. 